Hello and welcome back to Nature of the Beast. Uh, this one is called Look Up to the Sky. I'm Xenia. Um, I'm Sophia. That's Jamie, our ecologist. And this is Lauren, social media. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, we are Siren Calling. So we are a communication organisation. We work on environmental issues with young people, 16 to 25. Um, we create digital content amongst other things and try to help taco, tackle eco-anxiety in particular. And we're all based in Suffolk. Welcome to Albra. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fab, I mean, should we go straight into our first video and then we can chit chat in a bit? Let's do it. Did you know that seagulls don't exist? We're here at Albra Seafront to find out what the public thinks. <laughs> <laughs> Have you guys ever fed a seagull a chip? No, I don't think so. No. Have you ever had food stolen by a seagull? Yeah. I haven't. I know people I have. that have. I have. Yeah? What, what did you have stolen? Uh, it's a baguette. A whole baguette? Not a whole baguette, just like a bit of it. A bit of a baguette? Yeah. Well, I was wondering, have you ever fed a seagull chips? No. No? Have they ever stolen chips? Ice cream. Oh, they stole ice cream? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, from you? Mm -hmm. Oh no. A seagull chip? Yeah. Yeah. No? Yeah. Have, they been, have they ever stolen chips from you? Oh yes. Yeah? They've tried to stolen Cornish pasties <gasps> from my granddaughter who was most upset. You have as well. Have they ever stolen chips from <laughs> you? Yeah. 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 Who just threw a chip? <laughs> Not on purpose. Oh, Once, huh? like they stole a chip or something. Not, not intentionally. No. Do you think the uh, seagull enjoyed the chip? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Have they ever stolen chips from you? Um, no. No. Oh gosh! Wow, you're lucky. <laughs> Final question just to you is that did you know that seagulls don't actually exist? No. No? <laughs> I don't exist. No, I didn't know that. <laughs> just a shake of the head. <laughs> so in fact there's 13 species of gull in the UK. Oh I'm dressed as a seagull, but seagulls don't actually exist. How does that make you feel? Um what, they're because they're called black-headed gulls and things like that. We have an expert over here, ladies and gentlemen! <laughs> what types of seagull do you think there actually are in the wild? Give us a guess. I'm guessing 11? 11, that's a good guess. There's actually 30 of them, so... You weren't too far off, the last people said 100, so you, that's a good guess. <laughs> you guys? Oh yeah, I think I heard that fact before, yeah. Have you? Yeah, See? Sort of different type. Very nice. There's like the black, the black hooded ones, isn't it? I think Are you what a black-headed gull is? Do you know what? COVID safe, high five. Yeah. So you can go back to school tomorrow. Oh wait, where are we? September? Are we in September yet? Yeah. Almost. Oh, yes. oh. You can go to school in September and be like, guys, fun fact, seagulls don't exist. I confuse all your teachers. Can you do that for me? Yeah. 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 Did you know that there are 13 different types of gulls, but not a single one of them is called a seagull? The one that you're probably most familiar with is a heron gull, just like Solomon over here. The reason why you shouldn't feed seagulls chips is because it causes angel wing, which is where their wing becomes drooped, which leads to premature death in them. It is important not to call all gulls seagulls, as some species such as the kittiwake are of conservation concern.
So, I love that video. Um, we just want to send our love to Poppy, who is in the yellow coat and partially in the seagull costume as well. She's currently got coronavirus and all our thoughts and love are with her if she's watching at home, which I think she is. So that video was made by Poppy, Jamie and Hazel and Fia. <laughs> We've got Hazel here with us now. And my first question is, do you think that you taught the public anything? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, they all seem quite interested in seagulls. I was quite surprised. I thought that they were, might all be a bit bored by our seagull, seagull nerdiness, but they seemed quite fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> nice. nice. Do you want to ask the, yeah, the next one? Uh, well, well, did they teach you anything? Um, yeah, I was surprised that they actually had like some like good answers to the questions <laughs> and that they'd actually paid attention to it. Like it shows that people are actually quite aware of what's going on around them and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, nice. I think that's so true. And Jamie, what I love about that video is at the end, you go, some goals are of conservational concern, like the kitty wake. And then two weeks ago, whilst I was editing the video, we checked the conservational red list, which is the animals of, that are con of concern. And the herring goal is also on there, which you are dressed as. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, I have no excuse for that. No. <laughs> um, and not only are they on the, on the list, they're on the red list as they're well. On the red um, list with the my only wake. excuse is in Old Brother everywhere, and you get so easy to forget. Um, yeah. But I suppose an important lesson there to learn is you know, populations change and they're on the red list because of such a sharp decline quite quickly. Mm. So, and just because they're everywhere here doesn't mean they're everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Else. So, that's my bad. Yeah, sorry about that. that was all of our bads. <laughs> we should have checked that one before we did it. <laughs> do we um, know, sorry, do we know um, why they actually, why the decline is so? Um, so sure. I'm not actually so sure. I mean, I think the BT will probably be the best place to look. I haven't mm. really looked into that myself. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're not the only one on the list. I think uh, Kitty Wake and Herring are on the red list. And I think other species of gull, such as Lesser Black Back Gull, are on the amber list. Okay, so which, how many species of gull live in the store? On the store? Um, generally, I see Black Headed Gull, Herring Gull, Lesser Black Back, and Great Black Back. They're kind of the common ones. Um, but the most interesting about them is the age. So hang on, we'll get to that. <laughs> get, we'll get you've to missed the age. one. I miss, I miss one. I'm telling you, you've missed the oh, goal. Oh, I've missed um, the Missley Med goal, the Mediterranean goal. There um, is one Mediterranean goal. There is one Mediterranean Misty. goal on the, in the store A O and B. That there is. We believe is the same individual returning time and time again. We don't know it because it doesn't mean it's not ringed, but <laughs> yeah. it's it's quite a ringed local meaning, celebrity. Ringed meaning tags. R yeah, ringed meaning something it. on its leg that identifies an individual. So it is an unringed bird, but it's quite it's the only one that's returned to Miss Lee <laughs> Key for the last three yeah. years. So it's become a bit of a celebrity. And we <laughs> went to find him, didn't we, guys? We went to find is it Marvin? I nicknamed him Marvin. The Mediterranean yeah. goal, and here is some bonus seagull content it's an outtake from that day i know marvin looks a bit boring like that but where is it so marvin's in his winter plumage this is what he looked like in march oh, wow. proper blackhead orange sort of orange bill Where's all his black stuff got? So he's, he's molted so he's done breeding so now he's molted his feathers so he's losing all the black in his head should be called a blackhead gull, shouldn't it? Yeah, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And at the end of that clip, I think I asked you guys if a blackheaded gull had a black head, and you said. No, um, gulls are poorly named. <laughs> They're very poorly named. So a blackheaded gull has a chocolate brown head. Um, a Mediterranean gull is not from the Mediterranean, and common gulls are not very common. So. Um, <laughs> There's a bit of an issue there. And you literally rolled your eyes at the camera, Hazel, and you're like, oh my God. <laughs> Who named these? Is there a time where we can go? No, actually, I'm not even going to go into that. <laughs> um, so Marvin comes back year after year after year. And you were saying seagulls live a really long time, like a lot longer than we think they do. Yeah. So a lot of birds you see in your garden might have a lifespan of three to four years. Um, the oldest recorded gull in the UK, which is a European record, is a lesser blackback gull, which lived to 34 years old. So in the 90s? It could remember the 90s. It might have been around for the 90s, yeah. So we're saying it could have gone to see the Spice Girls? It very well could have done, yeah. So every time you see a goal, you don't know how old it's, it could be. There's yeah. um, two, a herring goal, which is, and a black-headed goal, which are currently 32 years old and still alive as far as we know. Gosh. So there could be new record breakers coming. That's amazing. It's weird to think there's birds older than us. Yeah. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, do you want to introduce the next video in that case? Yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the next video I made, uh, and it's about clothes. 
Yep. <laughs> hey, I'm Xenia, I'm a recent film graduate, and I live in a small village just outside of Woodbridge. I'll just be showing you three outfits made up of old, used, or upcycled clothes. This jumper was my mum's, it sadly had a stain on it, but you know, it gives it character. The jeans were also hers, and they're way too big for me, but I really like how baggy they are. And those shoes I got on eBay for £10. I upcycled that hoodie from an old childhood favourite of mine, and got those trousers from a vintage shop, their old army issue trousers. The Doc Martens I've had for 10 years, which just shows you how long they actually last. Here I just cropped an old shirt of my dad's, and that white top is from eBay as well. The trousers are made of my mum's old pyjama bottoms, and I used a tea towel to make those pockets. And these shoes were given to me by a friend who they didn't fit, and I really liked them, but they didn't fit me either, so I just sewed in some elastic. I've been really lucky with the fact that my parents have actually kept a lot of their old clothes, and are now letting me wear them and use them in these ways that I've shown you. But you might not have that, in which case maybe try your friends, or try your grandparents, or aunts and uncles, or cousins, or siblings, anything like that. And if you can't find any cool clothes there, then charity shops are great. Even though it takes some rummaging, but it's worth it in the end when you find something you really end up loving. Vintage shops are another good option. I know that they're definitely more expensive than charity shops, typically. The reason that they are more expensive is because the items are curated, and they've lasted a really long time because they're very good quality, typically. I mean, it's, it's not every shop, but one would hope. Um, so you might find something really amazing and unique there, and that might be worth investing in. And if none of those are options for you, and you still have clothes from when you were younger that you never wear anymore, but you still kind of like aspects of it. I mean, that hoodie that I showed you in the video, was really really hideous and it still is pretty hideous but it didn't fit me previously and then I just kind of I cropped it, I moved the zip around a bit, I put some elastic in and I turned it inside out to hide some of the design and now I actually wear it. And it's, it's just giving items new life that might have been important to you in the past or you just have some kind of attachment to it and it's really nice to be able to keep those things actively in your life. Amazing video. Thanks. Really great. <laughs> no. So we've had a theme running through all our streams with our young producers and with some of us as well, talking about little ways we can help reduce our environmental impact. So tiny things we can do every day. Um, what have we covered so far? Oh, reducing water. Soap. Soap. Different kinds of soap you can use. Yeah, lots of beauty products. Beauty projects. Project products. <laughs> Um, and we've covered foraging as well, and we'll get back onto food again later. Mm. Um, but I guess, do you want to talk us through your outfit of the day today, the OOTD? Oh, well, I'm wearing the <laughs> same shoes I was wearing before. These were on eBay. Uh, these jeans were 10 quid in a vintage shop in Woodbridge when they were on sale. Um, and this hoodie was also 10 pounds in a charity shop. And it's really, really comfy. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. And the thing is, is every time I see you, I feel like you guys probably feel the same as well. I go, Sonia, I really love those jeans you are. Sonia, I really love that one I know you are. And you go, it's my mum's. Yeah. <laughs> go, it's my dad's. A lot of this, yeah, yeah. They had very good clothes back in, my, my parents are old, so it's like 70s, 70s 80s and 80s. 90s. <laughs> Do you, your parents, anyone, anyone else? I think that's a really cool idea. I've, I've never really thought to rummage through other people's closets to, <laughs> yeah. to change a look. And oh, there's also actually something I didn't mention. Um, clothes swaps. Mm -hmm. I haven't done this, but even brands are doing it now. There's a really cool brand called Toast. We're not sponsored, but um, not yet. very cool brand. Uh, and they do clothes swaps with like their, because they're very about sustainability and kind of keeping and, and upcycling clothes or having artists kind of redo them and stitch into them. So it's just about like you might have something your friend's been wanting for ages. So you could just swap it with your friend mm. and you can both get new life in your wardrobe and it's also temporary or you can go to like vintage Keeler sales, which I also haven't done, but I've heard of really good. Really know, have you guys good. tried them? Yeah, we, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've been to one, I've been to one. What about you? You're asking the wrong person when it comes to fashion. I'm really sorry. This is, I'm out, I'm it's out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. Uh, we, um, we've had someone comment online um, whether you think that people are interested in upcycling um, particularly because it adds individuality mm. to it. Yeah, mm. I, th I think that's a really important point of it because I don't. It's, it's so fun when you've kind of added something that you yourself have put into it, like stitching or putting on like a patch or anything like that, and it's like unique and no one else will have it. Like those horrible uh, 
that hoodie thing that I made. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know where that hoodie came from. It was really ugly. Like, you know something that you wear when you're maybe eight years old and it has like a dragon design on the front. And then, you know, just being able to kind of have something no one else has for sure. And they probably wouldn't wear because it is still ugly, but like, <laughs> it's just so nice. And you can feel really proud of the work you've done on your mm-hmm. clothes. And it's so much fun thinking about how you can rework things as well. Mm. Yeah. So do you find, it, is it quite difficult to do those sort of upcycling have you taught yourself or yeah I think it's YouTube is very helpful but um you can hand stitch a lot of little things like if you wanted to kind of put a pocket on something you could probably hand stitch that sewing machines really help obviously as well mm. um I don't know use pins get creative with how you're attaching things to your clothes as well embroidery is fun mm. I've heard I haven't done it um it can be complicated depending on how much you're trying to rework something but the simple things are also very effective Mm. Yeah, did you have one in, was it that video where you had one with safety pins? Was that something else? Maybe you were wearing something where there was like a rip in something, which I probably should do for these jeans, to be fair. <laughs> and you like sort of half safety pinned it together and it completely changes the way the look is. I haven't done that, but it sounds or good. someone else, yeah. Yeah, people kind of reattach sleeves with safety pins as well. It's really fun. You can yeah. do such cool things with clothes and it's kind of, no one's, there's no rules on it with how you do it. So you can... I didn't use whatever you want. I mean, like the kitchen, mm. the tea towel I used for pockets. Mm. And yeah. it's stained and old and it was going to, you know, it was like just nice. that challenge on Great British Sewing Bee. Mm. Has anyone ever watched that? Nope. They have to take one garment and turn it into another garment. Oh, that's cool. I've been forced to watch it by my mum. Nice. I am familiar Big with that shout one. Shout out, <laughs> well done, shout thanks, out James Thank mum. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, the next video is all about turtle doves. <laughs> and you know when you're in a meeting and someone says, let's get creative, what should we do to make this interesting? And you say something and you think, there is no way on earth anyone's gonna run with this. It's a stupid thing, it will get put in the bin and we'll think of something better. Yeah, that didn't happen, so enjoy. Hi, so this next video wait, wait, is going to be... Wait, wait, you can't do this one without me. You can't do this one without me. What are you wearing? Turtle doves, right? Like the 12 days of Christmas? 12 turtle dove facts? We're actually only doing 10, but um, <laughs> be my guest. Go for it. <laughs> turtle doves were first recorded in the UK in medieval times. Turtle doves complete an annual migration from their breeding grounds here in the UK to their wintering grounds over in West Africa. They can fly up to 3,000 miles for this migration. Their call sounds a bit like the purr of a cat. Turtle doves nest and roost in woodland, hedgerows and scrub. They eat wildflower seeds, so scrub areas such as this are really important. They feed their young crop milk, which isn't like mammal milk, but a secretion from inside of their necks. Both male and female doves can produce it, regurgitating it up to feed the chicks. Turtle doves are monogamous and mate for life, taking only one partner. Both parents work together to build the nest and to incubate the eggs. Even though the store is a turtle dove hotspot, they are one of the UK's most threatened bird species, with a 94% decline in the last 25 years. As well as illegal poaching, this decline is mainly due to unsustainable farming practices that destroy wildflower habitats. To help our turtle dove population, you can put some clean, shallow water, like a pond or a bird bath, in your garden. Water is really important for turtle doves, especially when they're rearing their chicks. Loads of musicians have sung about turtle doves, including Madonna, Frank Sinatra, Cliff Richard, Barry Manilow, and Elvis. Thank you very much. <laughs> also, partridges don't live in pear trees. <laughs> sounds a bit like a purr of a cat. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we're ever going to live that one down. <laughs> so, cool. Um, at the end, partridges, right, don't live in pear trees. Where do they live? <laughs> well, partridges are often on agricultural fields. We've got two partridges in the UK, red-legged partridge and grey partridge. Uh, grey partridge is actually um, an indicator, it's a farmland indicator species. So 
generally if you see grey partridge you know you're looking at healthy farmland you know which yeah. isn't too intensive nice. okay that's really i didn't know that yeah, that's really know. interesting red legged partridges are everywhere so they <laughs> don't yeah they're all more about their ones yeah nice. and they're like so the theme of that video was brink of extinction yeah how we were at Rabness, which is like all this beautiful scrubland and i think we did hear a one whilst we were there but we didn't see any what why are things obviously they're losing their habitat but why are things so bad and how bad is it it's it's really bad i remember when um in 2011 my mum took me to um bird the bird fair the national bird fair which is up in rutland it's a real thing. it <laughs> is a real thing and i love it um big hole in my heart with covid um and i was told in 2011 that in 2021 turtle doves are going to be extinct in the uk so it's 2021 it's 2021 <laughs> and they're still going but there is i think the height the video highlighted it quite well um there's massive issues on migration. So they do have a long migration, but they're often getting uh, shot out of the skies in the Mediterranean. Um, it's more of a tradition, uh, long standing tradition is why they're being shot often, especially in areas like Malta. Um, but Actually, also- I, Malta, is that not, they shoot geese there as well? Is Malta right? shoot anything that flies, Excellent. really. Okay. Um, <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> not, all, not all the Maltese people, but there is a long standing <laughs> yeah. tradition there. Um, but also we can't ignore the issues we've got in the UK. We, we are, intensive agriculture is making it really hard for them to get the food they need and you know we undervalue i think we undervalue scrubland in the uk i think i don't know if it's just because the word scrub is why people don't like it but it is such an important habitat mm. um it's oh. imp go on muntjac and uh, yeah, yeah you can we lead saw one didn't we when we were there yeah we can lead it into muntjac so muntjac is an alien invasive species um they browse on scrub really heavily and that will affect um, the amount of scrub available for nesting things like nightingales, and it can affect turtle dove as well. There's more of a correlation between muntjac ab abundance and uh, nightingale decline. Oh, God. Why? Such an unexpected yeah. thing. <laughs> why, so, wait, why is scrub so important? Because uh, it's, it's just full of uh, fantastic species. That It's just such a good ecosystem. It's fantastic for cover, shelter, provides food, plenty of nesting space. Mm. It's such an important habit. I mean, the list could go on for ages why scrub is important, but we do undervalue it in the UK. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are fantastic projects in Suffolk called the Scrub Up Britain. Um, they, they're based in Holsley. Um, I thought that was to do with like cleaning up graffiti or something. Scrub, yeah, Scrub Up Britain. We need we need more scrub and habitat. Um, and I think maybe it's undervalued in when people survey as well. That's always a bit of a concern of mine. But hopefully, we need to keep our scrub and see more of it. Like NEP, NEP rewilding. Project's a fantastic example. Which is down um, near Which Horsham is, in Sussex. Yeah, it's Sussex way, but they've got lots of scrub and they've got fantastic numbers of breeding turtle dove. Mm. They're a fantastic example for other people to, to look at when we want to increase turtle dove numbers. Is it night are nightingales the ones where if you like slow down their call, it sounds like a blue whale? That's what I've been told. I haven't oh, wow. tried it, but that is I, I have I've been told that. Well, uh, someone shared that fun fact but with me once. You, to me, you don't need to slow them down. Nightingale is the best songster in the UK. It's the to me, it's the best sounding bird there is. I know, man. Mm. Bar Personal now. preference. <laughs> <laughs> That's a throwback to a previous live stream, <laughs> which you can watch uh, on the YouTube channel. It's all available <laughs> to be rewatched. <laughs> Did you have any comments on social media? Yes, yeah. Um, I've had one comment online uh, saying, I really tried to see a turtle dove this summer, stalked one for about an hour and found it really difficult, but managed to hear one. Yeah, I've had similar issues. Um, when I was a sort of volunteer at Minsmere, I was watching, I was listening to one for about 10 minutes. I stood up, stood up and some guy goes, oh, did you see that? And I missed, completely missed it. So um, they are quite secretive. I mean, I find sometimes in the evening and early mornings the best when the, they're perching sometimes out in the open when they're purring. Mm. Um, but I mean, I had I got most of my best views during the pandemic, actually. So we obviously recorded that at Rabness. Um, we, like I said, we heard one, we didn't see any. But during the during lockdown, when there's been less human activity, I've seen more t turtle doves. The numbers were doing better mm. in in places like Rabness. Mm. See, yeah, it's funny you should say that. I think we're talking about lockdown again. Sorry, no, you've got another question. But someone said to me that seagulls were struggling because we were, the part of the reason we were talking about seagulls eating chips in that first video. There's no such thing as a seagull. <laughs> Goals, sorry, God getting that wrong um <laughs> it's because there have not been tourists on the beach eating chips for 18 months and so they've not had that food source and we've seen a lot more natural goal behavior like them actually hunting in the wild and i saw one i mean i was up in yorkshire somewhere dropping like a crab from the sky to crack it open and oh. eat the inside and i've never seen That's that so before. cool yeah. i mean goals are fantastic at finding an ecological niche so if, if you think of black-headed goals they were once probably a sea a sea land kind of you know beach sea kind of goal and now we see them in landfills inland because it's we're providing food for them so you know they they will adapt to our behaviors as 
to you know to survive and succeed mm, birds seem to do that like pigeons yeah it's true mm. did you have another yeah so a bit of a provocative one i guess <laughs> but um okay but why are they important what what would happen i guess if we if we did lose them I mean, it's, why do we want to lose anything? I mean, I think they are lovely, you know, they're a lovely charismatic species, but we don't want to be losing any of our species because it's our own health we're going to be damaging at the end of the day. Mm. You know, I, I don't like to think, oh, we, you know, we should protect these because they're pretty or cute or like, we should protect everything because it's our own health on the line as well. It's mm. biodiversity, is, you know, it's, we're losing it at a rapid rate and it needs to, we need to do everything we can to halt it. Mm. Sorry, yeah, a bit of a, more of a general answer to that, wasn't <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, the yeah. turtle doves being sexy. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, with turtle doves, I've always thought that they're white, and I've always seen them at like wedding venues, thinking that those are turtle doves. Is it a different breed of dove if it's a white one, or is it? S- so I mean, I, w- I think I wonder if a white dove is more of a cultural and historical kind of. That's how we see it, doves as being white. Mm. Um, they are a lovely kind of rufousy brown colour, um, and a lot of birds are brown. Like you get you get a lot of people saying little brown boring jobs when they look at little brown birds. <laughs> um, I can't remember the exact science behind it, but uh, browns, yellows, and I think reds are natural colours from their from the keratin, uh, which create from their feathers. Mm. Whereas when you see birds which are blue green, that's all structural plumage. So it's actually not that colour. It's the, it's the way the light's hitting the feathers that makes that colour. Like milk, yeah. milk isn't milk isn't white. So I can't exactly answer why they're white, but that's that's kind of Wait, the best I can do on that one. Wait, what? <laughs> milk is see-through. Do you not learn this in science? No. Yeah, milk is see-through. It's just the way the light's hitting it that makes it look white. So if you think about a kingfisher, they're not actually blue. But but oh, it turns I tea. A a d- oh, maybe I was lied to. I don't know. No, 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 but you're <laughs> right, because the light's still hitting it in the tea. In the my life is a lie. Mm. <laughs> I had another question for you, and I've, it's gone out of my head with that fact. I feel like you need a couple of minutes just to <laughs> reset on that one. <laughs> so wait, so white doves are a thing or aren't a thing? They are. Um, they have to be. I've seen I them. Mean, <laughs> people release them at weddings and stuff. Yeah, peace yeah, doves. I mean, I always, they're not, it's not like a native species that we're really interested in, I'll be honest. Yeah. Um, the only whitish dove I can think of in the UK is collared dove. So maybe out more, of the UK. They're more, more grey. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Is it? Uh, this is a dumb question. Is a, a pigeon is like a completely separate bird type. Yeah, I mean pigeons and doves are closely related, but they are okay. a, a completely different family. They do look quite similar. Yeah, yeah, closely related. Yeah. Nice. Learning everything today. Yeah. I'm still processing the milk. <laughs> is there anything else from social media? Uh, not much at the moment. But yeah, I really encourage anyone who's watching to send in the questions. Obviously. <laughs> Getting yeah. some really great answers here, yeah. Jamie. So yes, please get involved online. Chat with us. Let us know what's the best bird you've seen on the store estuary. <laughs> that will definitely kickstart a conversation with this one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's play the next video, shall we? So this is another little way we can reduce our environmental impact. It's about eating plant-based. Jamie's making vegan chili. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm from Brantham. And today I'll be making vegan chili to reduce the household's meat consumption.
I'm so hungry now. <laughs> so hungry, it's almost dinner time. Yeah. Um, you used to be a chef, right? Oh, I was hoping you weren't going to bring that up, but <laughs> yes. Yeah, before before getting into a college, I was a trained chef. That's cool. <laughs> uh, unless they're trained with those knife skills, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were all judging that. 100%. <laughs> that was a um, good list. I, can, I can't cut onions. I had, I had a friend who would cut them like intentionally in all the weirdest shapes and different sizes because he said it was like art, abstract art, compared to, I guess, the precise art of actually being a chef. I prefer abstract, it's quicker. <laughs> there we go. Milk is clear, onions are abstract art. There's yeah. your takeaway from this live stream. Um, it was like mainly like cupboard ingredients, right? Yeah, I think that was the idea. I'm, I was quite lazy. I wanted to see how easy can you do a vegan meal, one pan. Well, in my case, two, because as you can tell, I didn't get a big enough pan. Um, and trying to keep it as cheap as possible. I think sometimes when you go for a certain dietary requirement, when you cook, it can all of a sudden get quite expensive. So that was that was the idea behind it. Nice. I'm inspired to make chili. I've never actually made it, because I've always thought it's really complicated, but it looks pretty simple. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really easy just putting everything into a pan and then um, boiling it down. So nice. thank you for the person who edited that because <laughs> I, it was an absolute pain to film. Frankie. <laughs> thank you, Frankie. Yeah, thank you, Frankie. <laughs> um, what have we got? So, okay, yeah, any of those products, were they like hard to source? Because obviously nutritional yeast, I don't think they sell that everywhere. I can't remember, like vegan chocolate was in that. Yeah, I mean, it was all, I got it all from a main supermarket. There was nothing, I mean, I wanted dried ancho chili, the big ones, but I just uh, set up for ancho chili flakes and it still worked. What uh, are they? Ancho chili is just a, it's kind of a earthy chili. It's not really, really hot. And it's got quite an earthiness to it. Um, so that's why I use the Pink Floyd mug to get some flavor in there, just make a undrinkable coffee. <laughs> We've actually got a question about the Pink Floyd mug, if it's, <laughs> yes. if it's essential for me. It is essential. Chili. You should not make chili without a Pink Floyd mug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Gosh. And um, We've also got a question, advice for people who are maybe nervous about cooking vegan or who haven't cooked vegan before. Just take your time. It's anything simple. I feel like, you know, when you make something like a lasagna, it's a labor of love. Whereas just go for something one pan, easy, just chuck it in and let, let it let the, the heat do the work. You know, mm. I love lasagna. I it's love a labor lasagna. of love, though. That's, t that's too complicated. Just if you haven't, if you're not much of a cook, just start with something easy. I mean, I did uh, use like garlic, lazy garlic with the oil. You know, I couldn't mm. be bothered to chop garlic, so I just got a yeah. jar. I know it's a bit bad, but like, you know, those store cupboard hacks can just save time and effort, when, especially when you've you've got other things to do. Yeah, mm. garlic is a pain. I'd say to chop yeah. or even to you know this the mincing thing mm -hmm. there have you ever had a garlic grater so it's really off trying topic. to wash it yeah, the, yeah. that's rub but the, if you have a garlic grater it's just like a little ceramic thing with lots of like very shallow spikes and it works so well it's so oh and it's so easy to clean yeah those micro grates are fantastic it's fantastic garlic get, get one tricks. yeah um so i guess how could it have been even more environmentally friendly because we know veganism is one step potentially to reducing your environmental impact by reducing your consumption of animal, pro animal products. But there is so many other issues with food when it comes to the environment, like travel and supermarkets and plastic. And I mean, yeah, I mean, I was using ingredients there such as ancho chili, which obviously isn't grown in the UK as it is. You know, it's been imported. So um, with a chili, it's just uh, it's mostly veg, isn't it? We're, we're talking mm. about here. So just go for seasonal. Just choose seasonal. Yeah. Um, We've yeah. got some fantastic farmers markets in Suffolk, you know, sometimes it might be worth spending a little bit extra for fewer ingredients, but better quality local ingredients. Good mm. flavour. Exactly. Mm. It's pumpkin season soon, isn't it? It is. Yeah. We're going to go pumpkin picking. Oh, with, sorry, this is off topic again. No. <laughs> but with pumpkins, you know, and carving pumpkins is fun, but also like there's, you can make quite a few meals out of one if you just scrape it all well enough and just pumpkin risotto is really, really good. And then pumpkin pie is really, really nice as well. Don't know about a starter. Oh, I've never had pumpkin pie. The idea of pumpkin and sweet to me is just weird. It's, it it's basically, basically really just tastes like salted caramel. Pumpkin spice lattes are sweet, right? Never had a pumpkin and spice you put latte. Chocolate oh. in your chili. <laughs> I do. You know, the chili and chocolate, that's, that's a win. Yeah. That, that is pumpkin good. and sweet is too far for yeah, me. Yeah, it's, it is, it's very good. It's basically just texture and Aro not even aroma. Pumpkin doesn't smell nice, I'd say. Mm. But it's, it is, it, once you've got the spices in, mm. it just smells like autumn. Mm. It's really nice. Was there anything in that video that you messed up? Apart from the pan. Apart from the pan. <laughs> the pan. Um, not really. It was just, like I said, opening cans, washing stuff, putting it in the pan. So not really, no. Yeah. Fair. Nice. Fair. Uh, what was the other question that we had? Um, other ideas for vegan food? 
anything one pot curries you know yeah. I, I love a curry just something just something simple like just don't just anything you can chuck in a pan and let it go don't overcomplicate <laughs> don't it is the takeaway yeah. yeah it doesn't so. the ingredients are quite easy to source i mean it could be you know it gets really expensive if you start using those um meat alternatives mm. you know so if i wanted to do a like a, a chili which had like the fake mince in it would you know that would have been really expensive but also using those whole foods using the, the you know the beans getting the fiber from that is much is much better for you as well mm -hmm. and cheaper purer in a way almost yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah. So with um vegan recipes i know with baking, I find it, because I bake much more than I cook, I find it really difficult to bake vegan just because it really affects texture and cooking time and all those kinds of things. But with with general savoury cooking, would you say it's pretty easy just to swap things out and adapt a recipe to make it vegan? Or is it... Yeah, I think easy it? swaps. I think there's there's nothing you can't really swap in a recipe. I'm, I've been mm. challenged. I mean, eggs, is, I find it's hard, but even that's their products coming out for that now. So oh, Yeah, well, aquafaba. aquafaba. Aquafaba, yeah, yeah. from um, chickpea chickpeas. Chickpeas. And we worked this out, didn't we? In the last live stream, um, I baked a hedgehog cake and we didn't mention it, but that cake was all vegan. Um, and we used apple cider vinegar. Oh, yeah. Mixed with something else. I can't remember what I mixed it with now, but something I put something in the apple cider vinegar and it made it go all gloopy and disgusting. It literally looked like a ball of snot. Yeah. And then I poured that into my cake mix and that's what pretended to be the egg. But when I came to carve it into the hedgehog, as you will see if you go back and watch the video, all the videos are going to be available um, later on to watch. Um, it really crumbled. <laughs> I mean, it was tasty though. It was great. There, there is actually something you can forage as well that they call the the vegan egg, the broadleaf plantain. The seeds oh. on the stem. If you put those in water, they go gloopy like a like chia egg. seeds as well. It's very oh. yeah, very similar texture. What's your to favorite that? egg alternative? <laughs> Mine's chia egg. I like the chia egg. I love chia seeds. I think they're so taste like yeah. great texture. <laughs> I do like a scrambled tofu instead of scrambled eggs. I do. I would miss scrambled egg if I was fully vegan. I think. Mm. Um, anyway, should we move on? Next video. I think we have talked about vegan egg for long <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, Godwits. Godwits. I tell you what. Good old Godwits. Nine months ago, couldn't have told you what a Godwit was. Mm. Now, they're probably my favourite thing. So, watch this amazing video, which Hope has created for us. She's not here right now, but all our love is with her. Um, play VT. From July, they come to us from the land of ice and fire where thousands of a new generation have been born. Once known as whelps, yarwhelps or shriekers, elegant creatures that are faithful not only to their dwellings, but also to each other. A long life of journeying means that their paths as pairs are not always aligned yet still they return to the same partners and sites every year. Through remarkable synchronous arrival, within a day of each other, a pair will reunite to lay their eggs. Whilst the males have enough faith to wait for their mates for maybe a few days, females are far less patient. However, all is forgiven next year. Chicks are precocial, able to feed themselves immediately. Their parents shepherd them to suitable habitats for food and safety. Not yet possessing the ability of flight, the ground-living youngsters are vulnerable to predators. The arctic fox, non-native mink, and the elements can be equally unkind. Grounded for just a few weeks, they finally take flight heading south to an unknown destination completely dependent on which flock they follow. It is pure chance. Wherever their current guide takes them becomes an enduring pattern for life. Bringing a blaze of seasonal fiery colour to the late summer landscapes, 44,000 individuals pass through our coastal wetlands. Many remain, but some fly south to escape our winter, chasing the warmth. International travellers experiencing sights and sounds that many of us never will. Belgium, France, Portugal, Spain, 
A few even make it as far as Morocco and Senegal. Each traditional site is vital for them. If one of their locations is disturbed, their extraordinary faithfulness can also be their downfall. As humans, we hold their fate in our hands. Each site we destroy leaves them nowhere to go. So when we see these magnificent birds returning, joining those that remained, we know that we have kept for them a safe and reliable haven. There is a sense of comfort knowing that as they leave us in April, they are on their way to their partner and birthplace in untamed Iceland. What a beautiful video. Thank it's, you, Hope. Thank you, Hope. And Xenia, I know you worked on that a lot. I think Hope did most of the work. She really put it together. It, I don't think we could have done it without no. her. Well, and thank you to Ed Keeble as oh, well gosh, for yeah. all his work on that one. So as you can see, it's getting a bit dark here. And um, we've got the fire burning and some little tea lights and things, which is really lovely. Mm. Um, Lauren, you had some questions on social media about that one or about previous ones. previous ones? I can't remember. Yes, yeah, we've had some, some questions in. I guess uh, I'll send some Godwit questions over to you, Jamie. <laughs> um, what is the best place to see Godwit? I'm totally going to be biased and say go to the store estuary. Yeah, <laughs> in autumn, winter. Um, you can get really close. I love going to Missley Walls. I sort of go two hours before I eye tide and they can get really close to you don't, don't disturb don't like you know overstep the mark let them do their thing but you can get incredibly close for photography manning tree co-op yeah back of manning tree co-op uh, would recommend is pretty great good well. co-op firstly but secondly <laughs> if you cross up behind it there's a path and there's like you can see across the river there yeah so it, if you keep walking down if you get there at high tide from the manning tree co-op you've got hog marsh which is we we're talking about salt marsh another video and that's a high tide route for them so You'll see them on low tide, you'll see them feeding out on the mud flats, and at high tide, you'll see them often congregating in large numbers. The numbers will only build from now. Um, Why? Well, a lot of them still on migration and traveling. Yeah, so they're not Back all then. here? Uh, yeah, so a lot of them, I mean, um, the race of Godwit we get in the store is the Islandica race. And come, they, a lot of them come from Iceland. Race. Yeah, so black tailed Godwit is a species, but they have two races. So you've got a Lamosa, Lamosa race and the Islandica race, and we get the. Islandica race, which yeah. comes from Iceland. I like that it's Lamosa, Lamosa, Lamosa. Yeah. It's so, so creative. It's Is that really... the Latin name? Yeah. Okay, we've it's... gone way too complex in my brain. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Cool. But what do they do at night? Well, that depends what they want to do. Uh, I know it sounds a bit weird of a, a weird answer. <laughs> I want to watch Netflix. Depends. I mean, yeah, I mean, if they're migrating, a lot of birds will migrate at night because it's safer for them. It means less, less chance of predation. So if they are not reached the final destination they choose then they might just keep the, you know that they'll take the night as an opportunity mm -hmm. um whereas if you know if they're in a if they're at a wetland site where they're comfortable um and we get like a we had, last night we had a very bright full moon mm -hmm. um they might take that chance to feed on the mud flats so, you know if they can if they can see as well so full moon energy full moon energy yeah, yeah. what is generally with birds that what's their eyesight like i've Witness. fantastic because I, I can never get close enough to them oh. <laughs> um yeah really sharp a lot of birds are incredible their senses are incredibly sharp um they can a lot of them hear very well and see very well nice not all of them but majority <laughs> pigeons <laughs> so back last christmas when we first started planning this whole thing and we sat down to talk about the best <clears throat> species <laughs> in, the, in the store and like this uh, extension to the aomb and like the ecological concepts that we could link back to those species and we had like a big brainstorming session right here and you said godwits and we all groaned laughed at me groaned, groaned laughed, laughed at me russell was like absolutely not <laughs> um why did you say it because you stuck with it and now we've watched that video and we've all gone these are amazing like why at that time were you like, this is the one? Well, I think the video basically sums up why. But um, <laughs> the reason for me was I, I, I've grown up on the Stur Estuary. It's, it's been my home. I've been incredibly lucky to grow up there. Um, and, it, you know, I get to see fantastic numbers of them. You know, 2,000 flocks of 2,000 plus at times in the winter. Um, it's, I get to see their, you know, them changing. You know, how in the video you sort of said, you know, they're, in their breeding grounds, they all go the brick red, kind of orange. I get to sometimes see that transition when they arrive. Um, but really, the store estuary, I mean, it's, as, as it's now become part of the AONB, rightly, rightly so, um, 
they hold it holds internationally important numbers of the Islandica race. I think it's I think to be internationally important it has to be five percent of the population. I'm not entirely sure that that's correct, but that's what I'm that's that's just what I'm aware of from of the entire because that video was like forty four thousand go through our wetlands or our mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I think the, I think the store actually has can hold at some parts of the year at least five percent of the global population of the Islandica blacktail godwits, which is and which is why it deserve rightly so deserves to be an AONB it deserves as much protection as it can get and it does have some protection it's um it's a special it's an SPA which is a special protection area um what that means is I'm getting into a bit of a legal jargon or you know <laughs> jargon here but a lot of acronyms to <laughs> remember so, so SPA is um it's a protection site for birds it's this is a designated special protection site for birds it's under the wildlife and countryside act and uh, I, be I believe the store actually is also a Ramsar site and if it's not it should be but I think it is um which is a ramsar site is um it's basically a st rubber st i see it as a rubber stamp of approval this is a, interna a re internationally recognized important wetland site because mm -hmm. it's not just godwits i mean it's you're, you get fantastic numbers of red shank um you get to see oh, breeding see lapwing nearby oh. red sort of red shank lapwing turnstone i get good you get um good numbers of knot as well so it's, it's just a lovely site mm. So uh, have I convinced you now? <laughs> but, yeah. You yeah. haven't convinced everyone convinced. online. Then. Oh. oh, no, is it Russell in the chat? Russell. Right? <laughs> Russell's online. He says uh, leathery sea squirts are better. Well, oh. I wish he was here to talk about it because when we wrote the cards up for leathery sea squirt, I had they they squirt seawater and they they seemed a bit leathery. That was as much as I knew about them. So I'm I'm so disappointed <laughs> you're not here, Russell. <laughs> and if you've not seen the leathery sea squirt video, the live stream is currently available to watch on the YouTube channel, <laughs> and the video will be up later on our YouTube channel as well. Um, <sighs> yeah, thanks, Russ. Um, also, Godwits might eat them, which would be cool. Oh, like like if they eat them, does that mean I Russell. win? No, Russell's wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that, that's Someone fair. double check that. Someone, I, I'm not saying they do, but if they do, I think that's one nil to Jamie over Russell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other um, questions, Lauren? Yeah, I mean, back on your your point about migration, um, we had a question earlier in the chat um, asking about herring gulls, whether they migrate. Yes, they do. Um, I find their migration really hard to describe because it's it seems to be quite random. It seems like they just disperse all over the place. Um, so the only examples I can give is I spend a lot of time on the Felix O Peninsula at Langard Bird Observatory, and when colouring herring gulls turn up. Um, colouring. Well, should we get to colouring in a minute, or do you want to do that now? <laughs> uh, now. <laughs> okay. So do you want me to explain ringing first? Yes. Okay. So ringing is when you, it's the welfare, the welfare of birds is of most importance, but you catch them in a net. It's a very soft net called a mist net, um, and then you put a ring on their leg. Um, and that you know normally it's a metal ring with an individual code but coloring is a easier way to kind of visualize what bird you're seeing and different combinations of rings tells you where so they're from colored rings yeah. Col color so ring color ring so I, I had coloring color like sorry are dogs Co coloring <laughs> got you so i believe in the um the video of godwits there was a you saw a green and an orange mm, coloring yeah. so that tells you what individual that is um so with the herring goal uh, we've seen some coloring birds i can't i think it's like red with Colour a black number on it rings. and you know we found out they they sometimes head just cross towards the netherlands and come back again and <laughs> that's that's the that's why we ring birds because it, it lets us understand where birds are going to yeah you so know they bop around a lot the herring gulls yeah uh, herring gulls do black tail goddards can do the same they can you know i think we sometimes get birds that were on the wash in norfolk and then they'll just come kind of hop down to suffolk <laughs> um on the store um, I'm still calling the store Suffolk side because I'm biased. <laughs> um, and then I've been to the Algarve in Portugal, and I've seen colouring black tail goblets there. So you know they they can they will just keep, sometimes keep going south for winter. Okay. And okay. Speaking of, is it in Portugal that there's a big issue right now? Massive issue. Yeah, yeah at the airport. The airport. Yeah. Yeah. So the Tagus Airport is um, the, the area where the airport is. It's an airport that I think that's being planned to be built. I believe I'm not completely brushed up on this mm. uh, but i know it's an incredibly important site for godwits and other wading species and you know um if we lose if that gets lost to the development of an airport that could massively impact the populations on migration and all sorts it's uh, that would be an absolute ecological disaster if that airport gets built so everyone sign petitions against yes. that please <laughs> So to answer that question about the migration of herring gulls, Sorry, they bop around a lot. Bop around. <laughs> That's the scientific term. Yeah. <laughs> they bop, yeah. yeah. Lauren, anything else? Um, 
sort of moving on from birds, I think Xenia has inspired a couple of people on the chat and really just wanting to know if there's any particular fibres that you think of hardier or any brands that you think of better <laughs> or I guess that's your personal style it's, but it's definitely a personal thing but I would brands like toast again I just I really like them but I can't afford them that's <laughs> a, a big thing I think for younger people especially is that um, these kinds of brands will cost a lot of money but the point is with clothes clothes are meant to last a long time these fi like natural fibres and stuff they'll last jeans especially I mean you can have them these are old you know mm. <laughs> like I wear my parents clothes and that's 30 years of wear and that you're not meant fast fashion is a new invention and you're meant to keep clothes for much longer than trends so I'd say invest in pieces because they will they will do their time mm. and it, yeah it's good to invest in yeah and other brands yeah. <laughs> and so people who have make things statement well. pieces yeah things that you all wear like take like a denim jacket and a leather jacket mm -hmm. never gonna go out of fashion just buy it yep. make sure, like if it fits you perfectly and you love it and then you all hold on to that for the rest of your life you yeah know? and it'll come back around that's with fashion it's cycles mm. i mean as we're seeing now it's kind of been in the past few years like 80s 70s 60s and we're like in the 90s and really 2000s at the moment yeah. and it's just it will come back and materials and shapes and everything it all comes it's yeah it's fun so keep things and hold on to them and with leather especially because obviously we shouldn't be supporting that industry in new leather but it's it's it lasts so vintage leather use it vintage fur like wear it because it's already a coat so it's wear it dead. so it's already there but obviously don't make new fur things yeah. mm -hmm. it's kind of like it's it's kind of respecting the creature that's unfortunately been killed for this and then yeah, mm. being able to get the most use out of it, to make it worth it, at least mm. in that sense. Yeah. I saw someone on TikTok the other day saying that low-rise jeans were back. They are. Of naughty stick. Yeah. Absolutely not. No, <laughs> yeah. that's it. I'm calling it a day. I'm going to say I'm old. <laughs> that's okay. I'm not going back to that life. <laughs> Sorry, another point with clothes and foraging. I follow someone on Instagram. I think her name's Catherine Davy, and she uses natural foraged things to dye her clothes. And mm. oh, it's amazing. Mm. So I think look into those kinds of things because that's another way you can kind of upcycle something old is just to kind of forage for particular berries or plants that you can boil. Avocado seeds make pink clothes, which is surprising. Gosh. Yeah, it's so, you can do so much. It's so much fun. <laughs> I, wasted, I wasted the seed in my chilli, didn't I? I could have saved, yeah. the, I could have saved <laughs> it. Milk is clear. Avocado seeds dyed clothes pink. Yeah. What was the other one? I can't remember. Something else was absolutely What's crazy. Really onions. Just, onions. Just made a beetroot. Onions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. My lord, okay. Anything else? <laughs> well, flying back to what you just said about the airport, we've had it we had a couple flying. Of flying. Love that. <laughs> coming coming back to the to the point of what pre um what protections are in place to protect them. Well, I imagine it would be from the European Union protections. I find it really hard I'm not I'm not too genned up on um the European legislation because it's obviously in Portugal. Um in the UK our, our best protection is the Wildlife and Countryside Act, um, but it's still a bit weak. So it's, I think a lot of it's going to, uh, the best chance I think we've got to get this airport not going through is social pressure. Um, scientists are doing a fantastic job with mm. the paper they're releasing, so how, how bad it's going to be. Um, but yeah, I need to kind of brush up a little bit of my European legislation. Mm. So, I mean, have we got a lot more questions? No, I think that's, that's answered the ones that we've got now. Okay, cool. Yeah, I was thinking this might be a good time. You spent a little while earlier talking about the AOMB and what a Ramsar site is and what a SPA is. Nice, I'm getting nice. them. <laughs> um, this is probably a really good time to say a huge thank you to our funders. That is the Suffolk Coast and Heath AOMB, the British Ecological Society, the Suffolk Naturalist Society and Lotto Community Fund. Huge thank you to them for making this all possible. We said this before and I will say it again. It's probably a once in a lifetime thing for us. Once in a lifetime thing for Siren to be able to do and it's an absolute honour and a privilege. Um, okay, next video. All right, the next one's a bit mental. <laughs> um, it's all about bats and as you can see, it is getting very dark here. Um, so I hope you all enjoy the bat video and we are going to pop inside after that 
partly for better lighting, but also because we're going to have some live music. So we will see you inside in about three minutes and 19 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> Sophia, what is this next video about? Do you know what? I'll give you a clue. You ready? Na 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 Batman! I'm Batman! But wait, hold on. What's Batman got to do with ecology? Clearly we're just going to go talk about how awesome bats are. To the Batmobile! Oh. Look, we're on a tight budget, okay? So where are we going? We are going to one of my favourite places on the store estuary. And it's also one of the best places to see bats. It's called Stutton Church. Na 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 Bat Church! Driving, driving, having a drive in real life, having a drive. Here we are. Ooh, spooky. Hold on, they're not going to bite me, are they? No, don't be silly. There's only three species of vampiric bat and they're all in Central and South America. What happens if they fly into my hair? Let's have an epic fact battle! Oh. Fact! Did you know a quarter of all mammal species are bats? There's over 1,300 species of bat! Pow! Fact! The bats here in Stutton Church are pipistrelle bats. They're a species of microbat that weighs the same as a pound coin. Huh. Fact! Pipistrelles eat midges and mosquitoes so help stop us getting bitten. In fact, they eat almost 3,000 in a night. They're natural pest controls. Wah! Fact! Bats use sound to see in the dark. They use echolocation to bounce off objects to tell how far away they are. Wah! Even primary school children know that. Fail! But did you know that bats are actually louder than road words? It's just too high a frequency for us to hear. I didn't know that. No! Did you know that bats are actually an internationally protected species? There's not many of those. That is a good fact. Mm. back and we're inside where the lighting's a bit better and you can probably see the band somewhere behind us I don't quite know how the shots lined up <laughs> um, there were some bats beginning to fly overhead which I'm told are no it's a paper straw spur 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 we don't know which species it is okay the ones that come out early well I find nocturnal comes out first yeah um, in the sort of twilight they're, they're bigger um, and then you've got two, well, you've got plenty of species of pipistrelles, but the two common ones are common pipistrelle and soprano pipistrelle. So you yes. can't really identify the difference between them by sight. You need okay, well, that is one of the questions, actually. It's really hard to identify bats by sight. Which are we most likely to see and how can we identify them? I mean, they're both really common, common, common pipistrelle and soprano. So what I'd recommend is getting a bat detector. And if you set your bat detector to 45 kilohertz, you'll be looking for common pipistrelle and soprano. You'll be setting yeah. it to 55 kilohertz. Okay, nice. Can you get apps on your phone that do things like that? You can. There's an uh, echo meter, um, but the adapter's like 200 quid. Um, oh. so How much is a bat detector? Uh, you get the, the basic bat, I think it's called a bat box. And they're, they're, they're a bit cheap. That's the cheapest one. Um, and that you have to manually set in the, the frequency, but that's a that? really good thing to play around. I can't remember because I normally borrow them mm. from the university. This mm. is pricey. Use your this contacts. apology stuff. Yeah. yeah I'd borrow. recommend getting one. It's a lot of fun. Borrow and beg. Borrow and rent. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, rent. <laughs> rent. Yeah, this is also true. Um, I can't 
can't believe we did a bat video and it was all Batman themed. Yeah. I, it's quite fun to film. You had really the GoPro fun. bits as well. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that was good. Um, ooh. So what are we supposed to do, Jamie, if we encounter like a gra- is it, I don't know if it's the right word, grounded or injured bat? Okay, well, um, all bats are legally protected, so try to avoid handling them. I well, just don't handle them. Um, as you, you know, you did a really cool video on bats, so you know, you got, you got Batman, you did some stuff like that, but there's also a national bat helpline. Um, so contact the British, uh, the Bat Conservation Trust, and there's fantastic volunteers that will help you if you ever come across any sort of bat that you think is in trouble. Mm-hmm. What about if it comes into your house? Because I've had that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as in like flying around the room. <laughs> it's that, I, I'm scared of them. I have a really irrational fear of bats and moths getting caught in my hair. And I know that sounds really silly, but when you've got long hair, I really I don't want to kill it. Did, oh, yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa! You, you never kill it. No, no but I don't never want kill it to get bat. tangled no, and or, then panic. No, or, you don't kill the moth either. You identify oh, the moth and then you release it. But if it's in my hair. Yeah, you can. It's easier to identify. It's trapped. Mm, okay. Oh. At least <laughs> Russell doesn't have that issue, as we learned from that previous video. <laughs> but back to the question: What do I do yeah. if it's in my house? I open your windows. That's what I've done. I've, uh, I've had that before. Yeah. They, just, they, will, they will fly out. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, oh. I mean. They can't see, it's echo location, they're moving around with echo location. So. But they're not dumb, so. They're not dumb, so <laughs> hopefully if you open your windows, they'll fly out. That's yeah. If not, and you're in trouble, then call the National Bat Helpline. I feel like it typically call happens at night, and helpline. they probably won't pick up <laughs> if I'm calling them at like three in the morning. Yeah, well they might, you never know. We don't know what hours they're open. Go and Google it and check out what yeah. hours they're open. All right, so, um, Lauren is slightly off camera, but was there any bat questions on social media before I move on? Um, Grace online has said, should I take it personally that a bat once hit me in the face? Oh my god, oh, lucky you. I <laughs> That's mean, kind of cool. <laughs> big one, little one, let us know. I'd be interested, because if it's a big one, that's going to hurt. Yeah. I feel like it's echo location's a bit off on that one. Yeah, mm. <laughs> very true, very true. Anything else? Um, and uh, a bit more of a, a serious one from Daisy. Do different species of bats have different sounds? Yes, um, yes, they really do. Um, so nocturnal, which... If you do get a bat detector and you put it at 20 kilohertz, it's got like a chip chop kind of sound when you hear it. It's like chip chop, chip chop. Um, and pipistrels, they sound quite slappy. And I don't know how to describe that, but it's just a very slappy noise. Like that? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And a final comment the bat detector sounds like something Adam West would use. Who's Adam West? Uh, wait, isn't that from Family Guy? Is, is that Family Guy reference? No? He's the original Batman. Oh, see, so uh, we're all too we're young, too young. <laughs> to know who the original Batman is. It's a young people's really, live stream. I feel bad I didn't know that. It's <laughs> really bad. Okay, we are going to wrap up now. So, thank you so much to everyone who has contributed to our live streams, everyone who's made content, everyone who's helped out with press, social media, edited videos behind the scenes. Even Faye came up with videos. Hi, girl, know you're watching. Sucks that you can't be here. Um, everyone in this room, Josh for doing the live stream, these guys for being amazing presenters, and Lauren for being all on our social media. I shouldn't have started naming people. Ian and Gina especially, <laughs> Jen Broad for all your input. We really appreciate it. I said it in the past live streams and I'll say it again. Majority of our team are 16 to 25. We are all young people, the people running this, the people behind the cameras, the musicians, the editors. Um, we have a very small group of adults that help steer the ship, but really we're pointing the direction and we're incredibly lucky and privileged to be able to do that. Um, all the content is going to be available later online. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. We are going to go to some amazing live music from River, Laura and John. Um, they are going to play us out and I really hope you guys enjoy. Should we get out of the way? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs>
one more song, and this one is called Blood. Um, and although most of the tunes we've been playing today are climate change themed, this one especially so. <laughs> Thank you. 